Okay. I think there was a new button introduced. Maybe it's working now. Now it's working. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry for this <clears throat> late start. And sorry for being unpolite. That this does not work out. Again, I did it already, but you cannot listen to that. We would like to welcome you warmly to our webinar series, which starts today with the <clears throat> topic about hydrogen and hydrogen derivatives, possibilities, and constraints. Um, <clears throat> we will show you now the overall program um, where you can see that today we will have an opening event with the significance of hydrogen derivatives, and then <clears throat> We will go through the different derivatives. We will tackle then green hydrogen production with innovative approach, then the ammonia transportation and use, and then the hydrogen methanation and the transportation. And, later, and, and last but not least, about the production of long chain hydrocarbons based on <clears throat> fissure drop processes. And last but not least, on the end of February, always on Wednesday at seven o'clock, the comparison of hydrogen derivatives and hydrogen supply options. This is what you can expect. And again, a very warm welcome from my, uh, myself on behalf of, on one hand side, the different organizer. This is the Tunisian Green Hydrogen Society. And in Biserte in Tunisia, this is the higher school of renewable energies, environment and sustainable development in Batna in Algeria. And here in Germany, it's the German Engineering Association with the chapter in Hamburg, as well as the Energieforschungsverbund also in Hamburg. And of course, our university supporting this webinar with the resources of the university. This is what we plan to do tonight. And with this, I would like to announce the first presentation, which we will we can listen tonight, today. First, I will go a little bit in detail about, let's say, setting the scene. And then my colleague Fabian Karels will go on hydrogen transportation, pros and cons of various transport options. And then I will try to make a kind of wrap up. This is what you can expect. And <clears throat> based on this, um, I will now share my screen. And <clears throat> then hopefully everything will <clears throat> work out as it is planned for the time being. So hopefully you can see my screen now. And <clears throat> let's say when we look about the significance of hydrogen derivatives and the necessity to do this, then <clears throat> let's say we have to um, look what is the driver behind. And when we look about the driver behind, then um, yesterday in the news, we found this graphic where they said it's, it's the increase in global surface temperature compared to pre-industrial level um, <clears throat> related for the year 2023. And there you can see that in the 1850s, 1900s, since basically 1960, 1970, we've seen a clear increase in average temperature. And <clears throat> the year 2023 was with 0.6 degrees C warmer compared to the average 1991 till 2020, and 23 was with 1.48 degrees C above pre-industrial level related to 1850, 1900, the, the warmest year ever <clears throat> since starting of weather recording. <clears throat> The reason for this is that the increase in mean CO2 um, <clears throat> content in the atmosphere, this is what you can see very nicely here. These are the measurements from the <clears throat> more um, <clears throat> um, Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii in the US. And there you can see that the average share of CO2 is clearly increasing. And we can see this yearly cycle because when on the Northern hemisphere, we have summer, then a lot of growing um, plants absorb CO2 from the atmosphere and during winter time, it's going up because they are not <clears throat> active in this uh, respect. So when we look on the longer term, then we can see that since 1960, we have a clear increase from at these days, roughly 315 ppm to at the moment more than 420 ppm. 
And the reason for this is obviously the CO2 emissions due to the combustion of <clears throat> um, fossil fuel energy. And there you can see it's mainly coal, it's oil and gas, and also a little bit others. But <clears throat> um, this is what we have seen. And this development has very strongly, let's say, accelerated in the <clears throat> starting with the year 1950 onwards. And <clears throat> this is the reason for this very clear increase in CO2 emissions. So obviously, <clears throat> these CO2 emissions come out of the energy system. And this is what you can see here, that our energy system has basically also related to the year 2050 exploded. And <clears throat> today, in 2023, we had all-time height in the use of fossil fuel energy, mainly in coal, oil, and natural gas. So this is the situation what we do have. And for that reason, <clears throat> there is the strong necessity that we have to <clears throat> replace the fossil fuel energy due to climate change mitigation on one side, depletion of the available limited resources, and the increasing of supply um, <clears throat> uncertainties. So, <clears throat> and what we have seen, and this is a positive news, ladies and gentlemen, what we have seen is that in recent years, um, <clears throat> the let's say, non-CO2 options to provide um, electrical energy has very much gained importance. And this is what you can see here, for example, for wind. We have now installed globally on <clears throat> this world about 900 gigawatt in wind energy. And this is, um, <clears throat> let's say, realized basically on all different continents in Asia, Europe, North America, South America, and others. So this has shown a very tremendous development. And the same is true even with a higher <clears throat> growth rate for PV in the year <clears throat> 2022. <clears throat> or, yeah, 2022, we surpassed the 1,000 gigawatt installed capacity for PV. And there you also can see this is basically realized in all different countries. If we look at this on an energy side, then we can see that wind and solar have been very much accelerated since, let's say, 2000 or 2010. And today, wind contributes roughly with half of the electricity generation from hydropower, and PV contributes with about one third of it. But what you can see when you compare this, that hydropower is still increasing in average, but not so strong and with a much lower slope compared to wind and especially solar. So in the years to come, it's most likely that wind and solar will gain even more importance, more momentum on the market. And this is what you can see here, for example, all the projections which are published in recent years, they show that wind will basically, the markets will still explode and grow dramatically on a worldwide level. And the same is true also for solar. So therefore, there is hope that we will have more green energy inside our energy systems on a global level. And <clears throat> therefore, we can contribute to <clears throat> mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. The question is, do we have enough resources that this is possible? And there is a clear answer. Yes, we can. Yes, we do have the resources. When you look on this map about the average wind speeds, you can see that especially on the southern part of our world with the, let's say, west wind belt, you can see in Patagonia, <clears throat> um, there is a very much wind available or wind resources available. The same is also true for the south, for example, of New Zealand and <clears throat> also partly of <clears throat> Australia. And when we look more in the north, then we have in the western Sahara and parts of the Sahara, there's also a fairly high wind speeds. Additionally, when we go further north, and this is the reason why <clears throat> we're currently developing the North Sea with the wind <clears throat> resources, we also see quite substantial wind <clears throat> um, <clears throat> resources. So this is there, and for solar radiation, of course, it's also there. This is the main resource, is the desert, what we see in North <clears throat> Africa, or in the south of North Africa, um, <clears throat> especially in the countries like Algeria, and we also see huge solar re um, resources here in <clears throat> the south of Africa, as well as in Australia. So yeah, we do have the resources. 
So <clears throat> we can fulfill higher, significantly higher shares of our <clears throat> um, energy demand based on solar energy. But on one hand side, we have to look on the supply, which we just did. Yeah, So there is a lot of wind and solar energy possibly available. But what about the demand, the energy demand? And when you look about the energy demand and here the energy use per person in 2022, then we can see that this is mainly on the northern part of our world, on the northern hemisphere with North America, with Europe, and <clears throat> with, let's say, um, significant parts of Asia and also partly in the south, but mainly in the north. Now, the energy use per person is only one point, but we have also a lot of countries where a lot of people live. And this is, for example, true for India and China. And therefore, if you have a look on the absolute primary energy consumption in 2022, then you can see that, let's say, still North America and still Europe are the main demand centers. Yeah. <clears throat> but we also see that Asia also demands a lot of energy and the countries where we have a lot of supply from wind and solar, they do not demand such a lot of energy. From that point of view, we can come to a kind of intermediate conclusions. We have seen that most likely on a global scale, the energy demand will continue to grow. I mean, this is most likely. It is a development which we have seen the last 150 years, so there is no reason that we expect that this will not be the case. And if climate protection is taken serious, and from my personal point of view as a scientist, I think we should take it quite serious, the use of fossil fuels has to be substituted by renewable sources of energy. The use of wind power and solar radiation contributes more and more to cover the given energy demand on a global scale. But still, as we have seen on a relative low level, because even when we sum up hydropower, wind and solar, we are still only in the 1% share related to the overall energy consumption. From a potential point of view, technology-wise and related to economics, there is no showstopper preventing a fast expansion of an electricity provision from wind and solar, but promising pot potentials, as we have seen, are regionally not congruent with the main global energy demand centers. So that means the highest energy demand correlates, correlates with population density and industrialization level. So China, India, the US, Canada, Europe show very high and increasing energy demand and limited, easy, accessible, and economically usable wind and solar resources. Thus, like today, most likely also in the years to come, a global energy trade will be necessary to connect areas with a promising renewable energy supply and areas with a high energy demand. <clears throat> but in the future, if we take climate protection serious, ladies and gentlemen, we have to transport green energy and not black energy. And therefore, the arising question is how this green energy, and this is most likely hydrogen, and this is what we discussed already the last three years, <clears throat> so basically green electricity provided from wind turbines and from photovoltaic systems, how this green energy can be transported and stored in the most promising way. And this, <clears throat> Madame, Monsieur, Senores, Senoritas, meine Damen, meine Herren, ladies and gentlemen, this question is what is now tackled by my colleague Fabian Kautz. With this, I would like to finalize the first <clears throat> um, part of this evening presentation and pass over to Fabian. So the floor is yours, and <clears throat> we are very much interested in your presentation. All right. Thank you very much, Martin. Good evening, warm welcome to the webinar also from my side. I hope that you can hear me well. Um, yeah, and after we have gotten some background information by the presentation of Martin Kaltschmidt, I will now dig a bit deeper into the detailed topic uh, of the transportation of hydrogen. So yeah, we have seen that we need to transport the green energy and therefore um, the question is firstly how we can do this. So how the green hydrogen transport options are connected with the gen general issue of the green energy transportation. 
A basic dis dis distinction can be made between the transport of electricity on the one hand side and the transport of green molecules on the other hand side. The transport of green electricity is characterized by very low energy losses. This means that almost all of the energy generated, for example, by a wind turbine can be supplied to the end consumer. Another benefit is that all technology components for the electricity transport, so for example, power lines, converter stations, are available on a large scale since many years. However, a limitation of electricity transport is that it is bound to inflexible infrastructure. Yeah, so we have these power lines and especially the transport across oceans is uh, barely possible. It has also do, to be considered that the use of the transported green electricity is limited as not all sectors can be electrified. Yeah, so examples are um, the steel production or chemical industry where we also in a, in a green future need molecules. In addition, the storage of large amounts of energy can only be connected to electricity transport to a very limited extent. On the other hand, we have the transport of the green molecules. Here, the integration of large energy storage is uh, easily possible. For example, through, through underground gas storage, as we also see it today with natural gas. In addition, the molecule transport is much more flexible compared to electricity transport and the use of green molecules such as hydrogen and its derivates is possible in almost all of the end use sectors. Disadvantages are here the unavoidable losses that occur during the conversion of the green electricity into hydrogen and its derivates. And in addition, we see that not, that not all of the technologies we need for the transport of green molecules um, are available on a large scale already. As this webinar is about hydrogen and, this, uh, and its derivatives, I'm going to take a closer look at the transport of the green molecules in my further presentation. So um, when talking about transport of green molecules, a further distinction can be made between the continuous transport of these molecules, for example, via pipeline, as you can see here in the upper part of um, the slide with these two um, um, pictures. And on the other hand side, we have the discontinuous transport, um, for example, via ships, yeah, as we um, have it already today, for example, with the uh, transport of liquefied natural gas, also the transport of crude oil products. So the transport by ship is characterized in particular by its high degree of flexibility. This enables, for example, the development of global markets as we see it currently for the mentioned fuels and allows a comparatively low dependency on individual export or import regions. Challenges can be seen in the high conditioning effort, which um, leads to additional energy losses. Yeah, when we go um, this way, for example, or especially in, in the green molecules. Uh, I will go into this aspect in more detail later in my presentation. A further hurdle can be seen in the fact that not all components for the transport of hydrogen and its derivatives by ship are currently technolo technological mature. The transport via pipelines is particularly attractive for the for the transport of gaseous hydrogen when we talk about the green molecules. So some hydrogen pipelines already exist today to supply in industrial clusters, for example. As the hydrogen does not need to be processed further, the energy losses are typically the lowest here when we compare to the other um, hydrogen derivatives. In addition, pipelines can be designed comparative, comparatively easily for very large quantities of energy. Um, as with the electricity transport, the main disadvantage here is the inflexibility of the infrastructure. So to um, make a final statement for the different options, um, both options, ships on the one hand side, pipelines on the other hand side, do not compete uh, with each other, but complement each other. So we might need both and we might see both in the future for the green molecules. Nevertheless, the basic precondition to enable this uh, transport uh, for cost efficiency, uh, transport of green molecules is a 
is an adequate conditioning of um, the respective molecules. And this becomes clear when we take a look at the energy density of gaseous hydrogen. Yeah, so gaseous hydrogen is the, the foundation for all of the transportation options we will see later. And we see that also hydrogen has a very, very high gravimetric energy, yeah? so a lot of energy per kilogram. It has a very low volumetric energy, so very, very little energy per, per uh, square cubic meter, for example. This means that an immense amount of space is required for the storage of the gaseous hydrogen. And um, to overcome this, um, we need to do a specific conditioning of the hydrogen if we want to transport and store it in a cost-effective manner. So um, what, what options do we have for the hydrogen conditioning? Um, you see the most important ones here on this slide. And I will not go into detail because I will discuss them on the further slides and give you um, benefits and disadvantages for each of the options. Um, but you can see that here we have, um, for example, the compression of hydrogen or its liquefaction. We increase the um, volumetric energy density while we have the same gravimetric energy density as for the um, gaseous hydrogen in its um, um, yeah, normal form. And we can also go to, to the more chemical-based options, for example, liquid ammonia methanol, where we also have a very increased volumetric energy density, but we also have a bit lesser um, gravimetric energy density. All right, so the idea now is on the next slides to um, yeah, have a brief introduction to all of the um, hydrogen conditioning and transportation options. And firstly, we can divide or distinct between the physical conditioning of hydrogen, where the hydrogen, hydrogen remains in its elementary state. And on the other hand side, we have the chemical conditioning, where the hydrogen is bound at another molecule. So it's not anymore in its elementary state, becomes another molecule or is at least bound to another molecule. I would like to start with the compressed hydrogen. So this is possible to, yeah, we mentioned here 700 bars, but to be honest, it can be also compressed further, for example, 2000 bars. So um, when we talk about the compression of the hydrogen, this is basically common knowledge. So we can use um, the hydrogen compressors as you see them here in, in, yeah, um, in, de in their, their design. Um, this is already done today and pretty comparable to the compression of natural gas. We can transport the compressed hydrogen then via pipeline or via such trailers, which can be used for trucks, also for trains. And we can store it in large quantities um, in, for example, underground storage, as it's already done um, today with natural gas. This is pretty comparable for hydrogen. So. The benefits are that we have a low energy demand for conditioning. Yeah, we all only need to compress it. This is not that energy intensive. Um, also, there's no additional expense for reconditioning because the hydrogen stays in its elementary state. So we can use it directly as hydrogen again. And the hydrogen remains high purity. But on the other hand side, um, the volumetric energy density is comparably low. Um, if we look at other options, we will we will see later on. And um, there are high material requirements. For example, if we want to build tanks for mobile applications for the high pressure hydrogen, so we need really really strong tanks and high um, um, uh, very strong materials. Yeah, and uh, we also don't see that there's a global infrastructure already available for gaseous hydrogen. Another option is the liquefaction of the hydrogen. Here, we need to cool the hydrogen down to uh, roughly minus 250 degrees to, to, to make it a liquid. And um, this is a very energy intensive process. So yeah, we, as you see that we need at the moment 10 to 13 kilowatt hours per kilogram hydrogen to liquefy it. This can be lowered by further um, technology developments, but still, um, it, it would be really, it was is still very energy intensive. Um, it is already done today, especially in the aerospace industry. So for the NASA spaceships, 
they use liquefied hydrogen as a fuel. So um, this is a, is a real tank which exists in the in the US, I think, for liquefied hydrogen. Um, and yeah, we, we just have a really, really high energy density, which is way higher um, compared to the gaseous, compressed gaseous hydrogen. The benefits of the liquefied hydrogen, as I already mentioned, is the high, its high volumetric energy density. Again, we have a low recon reconditioning effort because, yeah, we just can evaporate it and then use it, for example, as a fuel for mobile applications. And um, the, the purity is still very high if we liquefy it, so we don't have any other elements, components, which uh, could be, um, yeah, be part of the final product. The downgrades, uh, I have already mentioned them, um, partly is that we have a high conditioning energy demand for the liquefaction. Um, we, we see that the, when, we, when we store the liquefied hydrogen over longer times, then um, there will be some heat um, going into the tank, which leads to unavoidable boil of losses. Um, uh, yeah, we just need to consider this if if we if we look at liquefied hydrogen, and we also don't have a global infrastructure for the for the liquefied hydrogen yet. So the first chemical option, yeah, now we are in the part in, in the in the um, area of the other molecules. Chemical conditioning um, is it is the use of ammonia. The production of ammonia from hydrogen is already done today. Um, as it's 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 done within the a so-called Haber-Bosch synthesis. This is a process, process which was invented already, I think, more than 100 years ago and is key process for the fertilizer industry. Here today, um, gray hydrogen, which means hydrogen from natural gas mainly, is combined with nitrogen, which can be extracted from the air in the exothermal Haber-Bosch synthesis to form the ammonia. Exothermal here means that additional heat is generated during the process, which could be used, but on the other hand side, which is also associated with energy losses. Yeah, then um, the ammonia could be used, for example, in fertilizer industry. Martin Kaltschmidt will talk about this later. And it is also possible to um, crack the ammonia again to gain pure hydrogen. Um, but here, this is an endothermal process, which means that we need to supply additional energy, mainly heat, to the cracking process. And um, yeah, just we, we lose additional energy and the energy efficiency of the overall um, supply chain is, is lower. If we look again on the uh, pros and cons, um, for ammonia, there is already a given infrastructure existing for, as I said, the fertilizer industry mainly. Um, the carrier substance, which is the nitrogen, can, nitrogen can be supplied easily. And there's a huge demand for pure ammonia, which means that if we um, use ammonia, ammonia as a hydrogen carrier, we could also use the ammonia directly and supply the existing demand. On the downgrades, we see that we have a high energy demand, especially for the dehydrogenation, and uh, we have the high energy losses during the um, ammonia synthesis. Um, if we uh, apply the ammonia cracking to, to get pure hydrogen again, then we need to consider that um, the purity of the hydrogen is kind of lower because it's very hard to, yeah, let's say, get rid of the nitrogen and the, the, the ammonia, which was not, not cracked. And ammonia is a, um, yeah, let's say, dangerous substance, especially for the environment and for the health, uh, which need, needs to be taken care of. Additional option or the next option are the so-called liquid organic hydrogen carriers. These are uh, specific substances, so uh, they are mainly based on crude oil. Um, and these substances are able to bound the hydrogen in a so-called hydrogenation process. And then we have kind of a charged carrier substance, which then can be transported really easily to um, the demand center. Um, for example, in existing infrastructures, in crude oil tankers, or also in pipelines. At the demand center, then we need to apply heat to, to um, uh, to to redissolute the hydrogen from the carrier substance. So this is why this is an um, um, endothermal process. So we, we need to supply heat to to get the hydrogen back. 
and then the the carrier substance can be transported back to the place of the hydrogen production to be again used in the cycle. Um, let's if we take a look on on the um, pros and cons, we see um, as I already said that the handling of these LOHC carrier substances is pretty easy in given infrastructures, mainly for the uh, for the crude oil industry and the oil industry. Um, we can store it in ambient conditions. Yeah, we don't need to cool it or apply high pressures. It just can be pumped into tanks at ambient conditions, so pretty easy. And it's not flammable or explosive, so it's a pretty safe handling. But um, we have a very, very high energy demand, especially for the dehydrogenation. So if we want to take back the hydrogen from the carrier substance, we need to supply a lot of heat. And um, yeah, it's it's let's say it's good if the heat is available for free, but um, if we have to produce the heat, then this is a very bad for the overall efficiency. The carrier material might be very expensive, and um, the large-scale hydrogenation and dehydrogenation plants are not yet proven because this is a pretty new technology. The next option we have is methanol. So um, it is also possible similar to the ammonia production to produce green methanol from the green hydrogen. Here, we need carbon dioxide as a carrier substance. And together with the hydrogen, we can form the methanol, which is CH4O. This process, again, as we have seen for ammonia and also for the LUHC, is exothermal. That, that means that we generate the, the heat and we lose um, part of the energy of the hydrogen. Um, yeah, the ammonia, then it's it's a it's a base chemical, um, most likely, so it can be used in, in different um, sectors. We will talk about this later too. And it is also possible to reform the ammonia, which means that we crack it, for example, in steam reforming. Um, um, so we need to, again, apply thermal energy to um, um, yeah, crack the uh, methanol back to to the original substances, hydrogen and carbon dioxide. The um, ammonia, the methanol can be transported in given infrastructures. So, for example, there are already methanol tankers available on the market, and it's also not very very difficult to adapt existing crude oil tankers for methanol transportation. We can also um, do the transportation and storage at ambient conditions. And as I mentioned, methanol is a base chemical for um, the industry. Therefore, there's already a pure methanol demand existing, which can be fulfilled comparable to ammonia. The downgrades are again, that we have a high energy demand if we don't want to use the methanol directly, but um, if we want to get back the hydrogen and uh, what we also have to consider, which is really, really important, is that we need the carbon dioxide to produce the methanol. And if we want to have a green energy supply, yeah, carbon neutral energy supply in a defossilized world, then we need green um, carbon dioxide too. Yeah, so we have to think about okay, where where is carbon dioxide available, which is not from fossil sources. This can be either from biomass or from the atmosphere. But um, especially if we if we and want to extract the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. This is a very, very energy intensive process, um, which which yeah has its own downgrades. Last but not least, we we also have the methane. Um, I can make this pretty pretty fast because this is pretty similar to methanol. So we can also produce um, methane in the methanation process from CO2 and hydrogen, pretty comparable to the methanol synthesis. Then we produce a so-called synthetic methane, which is basically from its chemical um, um, properties, similar or basically the same as the um, fossil natural gas. And as it's done already today, we can reform the methane to produce, again, hydrogen and carbon dioxide if we don't want to use the methane directly. Here. Um, Again, pretty comparable to methanol. We can transport it easily in given infrastructures. There's already a very, very high demand for pure methane, as you all know. We can use it, for example, in the in the heat um, supply or in the industry. 
um, and the, the applications are just very um, diverse. But if we want to get the hydrogen back, then there's an additional energy demand. We also need the green CO2, same as for methanol, to produce the green methane. And if we have leakages, so if the methane leaks into the atmosphere, then we have um, a high climate impact due to the um, um, high um, yeah, um, car, uh, greenhouse gas potential of, of the methane. The last option I want to present are the so-called metal hydrides. Um, these are kind of special because they are the own um, option to store the hydrogen in a, a, a form which is not liquid or um, gaseous, but solid. These metal, metal hydrides are specific metal compounds which are able to um, yeah, uh, let's say bound the hydrogen in its 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 um, yeah uh, chemical framework. So as you can see here, um, this is then how a metal uh, hydride looks, um, or how you can imagine it if it's loaded with hydrogen. So the hydrogen are the red dots, and the gray um, bubbles are then the um, the framework, the metal framework. And um, it's also possible, again, here to release the hydrogen from the metal hydrate, but we also need huge amounts of heat to, to release it. This is how it looks in, in, in practice. So it's more of a metal powder, and you can fill this metal powder, these metal hydrates, for example, in tanks, and then you have a, a pretty high volumetric storage density for the hydrogen. Um, the metal hydrides are not um, dangerous or flammable substances, so pretty easy to handle in this regard. They allow us to store the hydrogen with a very, very high volumetric energy density. And it's, it's on a long term, it's very safe to store the hydrogen, so we don't need to um, um, be afraid of explosions or stuff like this. The metal hydrides are really heavy, so um, the gravimetric energy density is pretty low, and there's a, a huge material requirement, especially if we want to um, store um, greater volumes of hydrogen. Yeah, I mean, if you have ammonia or if you have methanol, you just need to build a bigger tank. But if you use metal hydrides, then you need to um, supply a lot of these metals to to the tank and um, this might be then expensive we have a high technical effort for loading and unloading so we need big plans to do this and there's also a high energy demand for the hydrogen recovery so this is uh, this it uh, basically a final overview about the different um, options for the hydrogen storage and its transportation and especially if we talk about transportation, we then can, based on these different options you have seen on the last slides, we can um, make up the so-called hydrogen supply chains. So there, um, we just cover the whole um, range from the production of the hydrogen over its transport to um, the final end use. So we start with the green electricity and the water supply, then we go into the electrolysis to produce the hydrogen. If we then want to trans transport the hydrogen, we need to conditioning it. If we have um, just seen um, that we have the different options, then we, we have the transportation from the export um, location to the demand center. Um, we have the reconditioning, um, especially if you want to supply pure hydrogen and if we um, want to use a dairy bait where there's an existing demand, for example, ammonia or methanol, then we could get rid of the reconditioning and just use the dairy bait directly. If we want to now answer the question, okay, but what, what is the best uh, option, the best supply option, the best conditioning option, the best transport option, then, um, this is not an easy task. Uh, this is a research task, but we can just bring it down to um, the specific determination factors for the economic efficiency of supply options we always need to have in mind when we look at specific cases. So first we have to look at the transportation distance. Yeah. So if we have a very short transportation distance over several hundred kilometers, then there might be another a different option. The um, 
most favorable um, the, if, if, then compared to a transportation distance of 10,000 kilometers, for example. We have to also look at existing infrastructure. So what is available in the exporting countries? So for example, if we look at Algeria, where there's already infrastructure available for the transport of fossil fuels, then this might be um, an interesting aspect. We have to look at the final demand of the energy. Uh, do we need the pure hydrogen or do we maybe need ammonia or methanol or heat? Um, this could influence our, our decision. Um, another aspect could be the availability and cost of a sustainable carbon source. Yeah. So as I mentioned, if we want to go via methanol or via methane, synthetic methane, we need the green carbon. And there it could be a benefit if in the exporting country there is green carbon source available, for example, from biomass and that we don't have to extract it from the atmosphere. Lastly, we also have the cost of green electricity in the export and import uh, port country, and we have the abil availability of green heat. This is especially important when we talk about um, the supply of pure hydrogen via chemical um, options, where we typically need um, a lot of heat to um, reconditioning, to, to recover the hydrogen from um, the chemical molecule um, we use for the transportation. So let me draw a conclusion. Due to the limitations in electricity supply, most likely the international transport of green molecules will, like the trade of fossil fuel energy today, play an important role within a defossilized energy system. We have seen that green molecules can be transported via ships and pipelines. Both options are um, needed in the future, um, most likely besides the typical cheap transport of green molecules by pipeline, ship-based transport of these molecules is likely to gain relevance due to its high flexibility. We have seen that the gaseous hydrogen um, uh, is characterized by a very low, uh, by a, no, sorry, this is wrong. It has a high um, gravimetric energy, but it has a very low volumetric energy density. And um, so thus the options to transform hydrogen into another gas or into a liquid um, allow for more promising material characteristics related to a cost efficient ship transport. All forms of such a hydrogen transformation into derivatives are associated with specific advantages and disadvantages, as, have, as we have seen in the last part of the presentation. Um, so far, especially the hydrogen derivatives, ammonia, methanol, and synthetic natural gas are particularly promising for the transportation of green molecules because we already have the technologies and the infrastructure existing, Yeah, because we already have the ammonia market, the ammonia transportation, we have the methanol market, and we especially have the synthetic natural gas market and transportation infrastructure. And last but not least, the economic advantage of a specific derivative is additionally determined by the requirements of the final customer. And with this, so with a look on the final customer, I will give it back to Professor Kaltschmidt for the last and final part of our today's presentation. Thank you very much for your interest and attention. Yeah, Fabian, thank you very much um, <clears throat> for this very nice and very interesting presentation. And <clears throat> I would like again to apologize for a little bit of starting problems or challenges, what we have to face at the beginning. So for this small delay, so please apologize for that. Um, <clears throat> we will hopefully have this problem now solved and the next time it works in a much better way. So. Fabian, if you can stop your um, <clears throat> presentation, um, then I will um, <clears throat> pass over to the, our <clears throat> third part. So <clears throat> I hope that everybody can see this now. And <clears throat> let's say, as we have learned from um, <clears throat> Fabian Karels, um, it's very clear that let's say such a provision chain for hydrogen or hydrogen derivatives will also very much defined and motivated by the demand. And therefore let's have a look where we use hydrogen today in our global <clears throat> um, industrial society. 
And there you can see that, let's say for oil refining or crude oil refining, about 44% of the global hydrogen use is used. And another 37% is used for ammonia production and 12% is used for methanol production. Yeah? So that means most of the hydrogen used today, if we, uh, let's say, remove the crude oil refinery, because this is what we most likely will not see in 20 or 30 years, at least to this extent, then we can see that most ammo uh, um, hydrogen is needed for ammonia production and for methanol production. So this is what we see today, and this hydrogen basically comes mainly from fossil fuels and here mainly from natural gas as well as from coal and from petrol cooks. So this is the provision chain what we have seen and as I said this provision chain is on one hand side defined by the different factors which has been very nicely outlined by Fabian Karels but on the other hand side we also have looked to the demand side and there I just would like to give you a few ideas, a few insights into selected parts of these different markets. First of all, I would like to tackle the industry market. When we look about the industry, and this is in this case, I will only go in detail about the chemical industry. Then we have seen that, let's say, in the last two decades, we have seen on one hand side a clear increase in average in the demand for ammonia and a very strong growth of more than 100%, is more than doubled for methanol. Yeah? So today we see that the overall market for methanol is more than 150 million tons per year. And <clears throat> we have a slight growth of 12% in the last decade and the increase is broadly in line with the rising population because the main market for ammonia is fertilizer. And of course, when we talk about fertilizer, is, let's say, feeding of a growing world population. When you talk about methanol, then it's more than 100 million tons in 2020. As you can see, the demand has basically doubled within the last decade, and China's methanol economy is the main driver of this growth. And we have a very diverse use, but mainly it's used in chemical downstream processing. If we dig a little bit deeper into this market, then basically what we do is we use methane and we use water, and there we come up with the syngas. We add to the syngas <clears throat> additionally nitrogen, and <clears throat> then we go in a reactor um, after CO2 removal in a reactor, where, <clears throat> as um, Fabian already outlined, we convert N2, H2 <clears throat> into NH3 into ammonia, which is then basically used. When we look about the market at the moment, then about 70% is produced from natural gas, about 26% from coal and the rest from others. And <clears throat> about two thirds of the ammonia production is going into fertilizer um, and about 32% in chemicals. And this is explosives, pharmaceuticals, textile, uh, refrigerants and others. So this is what we see. And when we look in the future, then we have very clear statements, which you can find in literature that, <clears throat> let's say, there are a lot of announced projects for near zero emission ammonia production. This is what you can see on the left hand side of this graphic. So that basically <clears throat> there is a lot of projects which might come into force in the range of about maximum three to yeah, about three million tons. In summary, by the year 2030, about, let's say, green ammonia production. Some of them also go in line with um, the use of CCS, but this is only for us here, minor point. We can see that green ammonia gets more momentum and more projects are announced. And additionally, <clears throat> even when these assessments, what I just show here, uh, may be a little bit weak sometimes from the base of the um, database and from the projections because they depend also very much on the political frame conditions. But then you can see the yes, US green ammonia market might basically very strongly develop in the <clears throat> second half of the um, <clears throat> 2020s. <clears throat> and they expect in this case a very strong market growth. 
The same is true if you look for another company who also makes some assessments of the global ammonia supply. This is the US market on the left hand side, the global ammonia supply on the right hand side. There you can see that, let's say, this is also very much increasing in the years to come when we talk about green ammonia. So green ammonia has already substantial market and will gain even higher market volumes to the newly emerging additional markets. When we talk about methanol, it's more or less the same story. Um, <clears throat> here we also use for the time being natural gas. And then <clears throat> let's say we come up with a syn gas or synthesis gas, and this is um, converted within a methanol converter into methanol, and this methanol is used. Again, a look on the market, more or less the same story. Roughly two thirds of the feedstock today is natural gas. About one third is coal. And then we go for methanol. And this methanol is used by roughly 70% for chemicals. It's plastics, it paints, solvents, organic acids, and others. And about 30% is used for the fuel. Part of it is used for blending. Part of it is used for biodiesel production and <clears throat> the other for additives. So when we look about here, the market development, what we see, then you can see very nicely that let's say the Methanol Institute expect by, <clears throat> let's say the coming years, a very strong increase in green methanol products on one hand side, biomethanol, which is the green part and e-methanol, which is the pathway, what Fabian has shown very nicely. There you can see that this will strongly increase also most likely in the years to come. And what we can see is that the projection for 2050, what you can see on the right hand side, is that let's say fossil methanol will, according to this assessment, still stay in the market, but biomethanol and especially e-methanol will gain a lot of momentum and a lot of market relevance in the coming decades. So. If you look what is happening today already, and this is quite interesting, then we can see that China has already 18 projects on the way with, let's say, renewable methanol projects. In Denmark, we have a lot of Germany, in the US and Canada, in the Netherlands, Sweden, Chile. So you can see there's a lot of activities ongoing, and we find more and more statements from different market research um, companies that the global renewable methanol market is expected to explode in the years to come. So, and <clears throat> what we also see is not only the green methanol market is exploding, also the overall methanol market is expected to grow. So from that point of view, there is a clear growing tendency and there's a clear tendency towards much more green molecules in the methanol market. So we can state, ladies and gentlemen, that green methanol has already a substantial market and will gain even higher market volumes to the newly emerging additional markets. So that's for the time being about industry. Now let's have a look about transport. When we talk about transport, then we have a huge variety of different options. This is what you can see very nicely here. On the other side, we have passenger cars, we have heavy duty vehicles, we have buses, we have trains, we have ships, and of course, we have aviation. So all of them can basically work with pure hydrogen. All of them have announced that they will work with pure hydrogen, but where is the market heading indeed at the moment? So on one hand side, we have seen that the Renewable Energy Directive, <clears throat> RED2 and RED3, I will not go in detail about this. Um, <clears throat> then you can see that, let's say, this puts very strong <clears throat> let's say, um, borderlines and development pathways in the years to come, that the transportation, the ground-based transportation should become more environmental sound, at least based on a European perspective. And the result of this is that, let's say, we see that we have a transformation of the ground-based transportation, of the road-based transportation, clearly towards batteries. And this is also, let's say, very much driven and pushed yeah, by very strongly going, <clears throat> let's say, um, <clears throat> falling prices for batteries. Yeah? This is what we can see here from 2014 till 2020, 22, we have seen a clear 
decrease in the battery prices. And on the other hand side, we have seen that the market, the worldwide sale for battery electric vehicles has basically exploded. And <clears throat> we see that this market is more and more gaining momentum. So that means due to the latest technology development in the field of battery electric passenger cars and the dynamic, very dynamic market growth on a global scale, it is most likely from a current point of view that hydrogen powered passenger cars will not play a key role in ground-based transportation in the future. So this is from our current point of view, not the main market when we talk about hydrogen and hydrogen derivatives. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> what we also have seen is that the batteries, the energy density of the batteries, they have been improved, 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 improved. And we expect in the years to come that they will even further improve. This is what you can see here with the roadmap <clears throat> about the different developments, what we expect in the years to come, that let's say the energy density of the batteries Okay, that will <clears throat> become better and better and better. And this is also what we see at the moment in the, on the market. And <clears throat> the result of this is, sorry for that, the result of this is that let's say more and more of the big, <clears throat> let's say producer of vehicles, they state that they will go more and more into battery driven vehicles. And this is now also true. And this is a new development in the last two or three years. It is also true that also the <clears throat> big producer, they go for, let's say, battery driven trucks. Yeah. So, and this is what you can see here. This is a forecast of sales of heavy duty vehicles that we do not see, honestly, a lot of hydrogen fuel cell heavy duty vehicles. We see mostly still diesel till 2030, but more than 50% is expected that this will be a battery driven system. So based on this, we can conclude that, let's say for road transport in 2050, and this is what you can see here based on the energy transition outlook from the um, DNV, which is the latest version from 2023, that we see in a defossilized road transport in the future, battery electric vehicles will in all likelihood be predominantly used. Hydrogen and hydrogen derivatives will only be used in niche applications for some special, <clears throat> let's say, um, um, <clears throat> vehicles. So therefore, this is not the market what we see for the time being. What about maritime transport? For maritime, it's the same story. We also see a very clear transformation <clears throat> pathway that in 2025, the European Union says they have to reduce the carbon intensity by 2%. And in 2050, by 80%, according to the timeline, what you can see here. Therefore, the question is, what can we do when we talk about defossilization of maritime application? And there we have two options. And both options are currently very much, <clears throat> let's say, on the way. This is on one hand side, the methanol used. This is what you can see here. For example, Maersk is one of the, let's say, big shipping companies globally. They <clears throat> deployed the first large methanol enabled vessel of Asia in the Asian European trade line. And <clears throat> we also see that other um, solutions coming up where <clears throat> Metzile, which is an uh, engine producer for also engines for ships, what you can see on the lower right hand side of this graphic, they also run now and develop and optimize them on, <clears throat> let's say, methanol. This is one development pathway, which is very much on the way. And the other one is ammonia, yeah? because ammonia is also something what you can use in an engine. And this is what is currently very much discussed. And also the first, let's say, <clears throat> um, um, <clears throat> projects are here on the way that engines like here on the lower right hand side are powered by <clears throat> ammonia in the years to come. This is, for example, what you can see here from November 13th, 2023, that let's say the world's first clean ammonia powered container ship is on the way. And even the European Maritime Safety <clears throat> Association or organization agency, this is the right word, European Maritime Safety Agency um, <clears throat> gives out, uh, <clears throat> let's say, um, <clears throat> uh, manual about the potential of ammonia as fuel in shipping. 
So there's a lot of ongoing activities and therefore what we can expect. And again, we can see the energy transition outlook from DNV. We can expect that in the years to come, green methanol and or green ammonia are expected to be the predominant renewable marine fuels in the future. The first developments in the market for converting propulsion systems to these fuels can already be seen today and are already on the way. Yeah? So therefore, this is a market, this is a global market, and this is, of course, also a huge market. Now, what about aviation? When we talk about aviation, the same story. The European Union said, OK, there's the refuel EU aviation regulation. And they said, OK, we would like to have, let's say, <clears throat> sustainable aviation fuels to reduce climate, um, let's say, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. On one hand side, it's SAF, sustainable aviation fuels, and there's a subquota of PDL, power to liquid fuels, which is basically hydrogen driven. Yeah. So that means biogenic or synthetic PTL kerosene is the only sustainable option for the foreseeable future to decarbonize aviation. This is especially true for medium to long haul flights where novel propulsion systems based on liquid hydrogen are technologically too challenging. On the short and medium distance, it might be that we, have, we see, let's say, um, <clears throat> aeroplanes powered by liquid hydrogen, but on the long term, in the long haul, this is most unlikely. And therefore, what we see in the years to come on a global scale, we will see much more biofuels in aviation with sustainable biofuels. A lot of biorefineries are currently, let's say, developed. And in Germany or in Europe, um, there is more the focus on PTL kerosene. So there is also a market, it's a, maybe a smaller market for the time being, but there is a market, and especially in Germany, in Germany, there's a clear timeline for Germany's PTL roadmap that, let's say, the German government would like to push uh, use of hydrogen as bio, uh, power to liquid kerosene in the years to come. So therefore, what we can see in the years to come is that, let's say, for um, aviation, again, the energy transition outlook from DNV, we can see that, let's say, PTL kerosene, and this is e-fuels, this is this part, as well as, um, let's say, bioenergy or biofuels, or SAF, as we call it also, um, they will gain more and more, um, <clears throat> let's say, um, importance within the aviation sector. So again, there is a certain market, what we see in the years to come. So the last market, um, and then I come very fast to an end, is about the heating market in buildings. So, And there I just would like to show you one German slide, so please apologize for that. But it just would like to make sure that you can see that let's say in the northern or northern part of Europe or in the center and northern part where it's so bloody cold as at the moment with minus 10 degrees C. So there we need a lot of energy to heat our buildings. Yeah? And this is what you can see here that let's say a, 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 a clear share of this, let's say energy which is needed for heating purpose is for room heating, and the other one is also for process heating. This is partly hot water, and it's the provision of, um, let's say, thermal energy for industry and commerce. If you look at only about the heat for building, then you can see within the last year from 1995 till 2022, that we have in Germany, and this is also true for some of the other European countries, maybe not with the same percentage, but from tendency, that about 50% of our heat is coming from natural gas. Um, <clears throat> then we have also a little heating um, <clears throat> oil, which is clearly uh, going, uh, let's say, is shrinking the market. Then we have, <clears throat> let's say, some district heating, which is increasing in tendency. And then, of course, we have electrical heat pumps, which gain very fast market importance. And we have others, which is basically biomass. But what we can conclude is, despite the trend toward electric heat pumps, methane will in all likelihood remain a key energy source within the German heat supply for existing residential buildings within the next decades. And therefore, synthetic methane may be an option for defossilizing at least part of the stock 
because this 50%, they cannot be, let's say, changed on very short notice. So these are the markets what we see. And with this, I would like to come to an end for tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Madame and Monsieur, we have seen that hydrogen-based molecules are in den, uh, in den, indispensable, sorry for my bad German English, indispensable part of our overall global economy. They are used as a raw material as well as an energy carrier. And so far, these molecules are basically fossil based. Due to the need to transform our highly integrated global energy system towards more climate compatibility. And I think this transformation is urgently needed if we take greenhouse gas <clears throat> um, issues serious. Green molecules have to gain importance. There's no way out. Taking technological, economic, and systemic aspects into consideration, we can come to the following conclusions. The chemical industry, ladies and gentlemen, demands today already substantial amounts of ammonia and methanol. These pulp chemicals will become more increasingly green. Yeah? Within the transport sector, mainly the maritime and the aviation sector are demanding green molecules. Yeah? So we don't see it in road transport. We don't see it necessarily in trains. With mineral, um, mineral parts, yes, but not... For ship propulsion, it's mainly ammonia and methanol. And for long haul flights, it's fissure dropped based PTL uh, fuels, which are currently under discussion. Additionally, this is what I mentioned only um, <clears throat> as a side comment, minot markets might emerge for special purpose vehicles. For heat provision within the existing, the existing residential buildings, synthetic natural gas might be a promising option due to already existing developed infrastructure. This is also true for selected applications in industry and commerce. Related to the already existing and most likely emerging markets, green ammonia, green methanol, green methane, and fissure drops crude are the most important hydrogen derivatives from a current point of view. And to make it a little bit provocative for the discussion, at least for a transition period within the next couple let's say of years, the related end consumer markets are clearly bigger for green ammonia, green methane, and green methanol and fissure drops crude compared to the pure hydrogen markets. With this, we do believe, and this is the quintessence of <clears throat> the presentation from Fabian Karls and myself, the, <clears throat> the co overall conclusion is that, let's say, we will most likely see faster and more, uh, faster growing markets and more easily accessible markets for green ammonia, green methanol, and green methan, methane, as well as green fissure drops crude compared to pure hydrogen, which also has a market, but in these markets are more easily to develop. With this, I would like to terminate my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. And <clears throat> now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time that we can come to a kind of final discussion. So <clears throat> thank you very much for that. And was this, is there anything which comes up <clears throat> in the chat where you have some questions, comments, remarks, where you would like to discuss something which you always would like to say, and you never, never, ever has done so. There is one comment, why is the energy demand for road transport so strongly decreasing in the years to come? Well, <clears throat> this depends very much on the developments, what we see. Because when we go for road transportation with an um, internal combustion engine, then we have an efficiency which is, let's say, between 30 and 35% related to the fuel what you use. When you go for electricity, then there is a much higher efficiency because an electric engine, electric driven engine um, has an efficiency of roughly, let's say more than 90%. If we add up to the efficiency of the battery, then we are still above 80%. So even when we have increasing amount of, of, of person kilometers, which we will see in the years to come, the overall energy demand will go down related to the fuel what we use <clears throat> um, for that. So this is 
at least what I think the um, <clears throat> let's say that is the, the the explanation um, for the reason for that. So, ladies and gentlemen, if there's regarding using ammonia, this is the next point. Regarding using ammonia as a carrier for hydrogen, isn't the cracking also a very <clears throat> a very <clears throat> early technology state. Fabian, you would like to say something about that? Yes, uh, basically I can agree. So it's it's not um, available on a large scale yet, as far as, as I know. Um, if I remember our last year's webinar, we had um, a, a researcher from, um, I think, the University of Greifswald or Rostock, and they are in a, in a large research project funded by I think the German Ministry for Science um, and they are um, looking at the ammonia cracking and to try to um, yeah, develop this process further and try to enhance the efficiency. But yeah, as, as stated in the comment, it's, it's not um, uh, state of the art yet. Okay, this is what I also is also my um, <clears throat> status of knowledge, but a lot of activities are ongoing for the time being. Um, <clears throat> so therefore, we can expect that this technology might be available in the years to come. Um, but we still also have a little bit of time because so far we don't have any large scale <clears throat> production facilities for green ammonia. And as you have seen from our presentation from Fabian and myself, that let's say we see that um, also newly markets are emerging. So therefore this goes hand in hand with each other. Yeah, yeah. what might be added when we look at the systemic perspective. So um, I know that there are a lot of hydrogen production and export projects which are um, currently developed and they are often using the way of ammonia as, as, a, as a carrier. So you might have heard about um, project in, in um, Saudi Arabia, NEOM project, they want to export hydrogen in the form of um, ammonia. Um, and from my perspective, from my understanding, the way here would be in the, let's say, next 10 years to use the ammonia directly, the green ammonia, to substitute the um, gray hydrogen ammonia in the fertilizer industry and then um, when this demand is is met by the green ammonia, then um, hopefully the ammonia cracking will be developed further. And then um, if, if still ammonia is the way to go for hydrogen transportation, um, it can be cracked uh, more efficient than it would be the, 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 um, um, the, the point today. Okay, then ladies and gentlemen, I would like to terminate. Huh? I'm sure I'm not a terminator, but nevertheless, I would like to finalize this webinar for tonight. I would like again to apologize for the technical challenges, what we have to face at the beginning. So please apologize for that. We promise that it hopefully works better next time. And this is a good um, keyword because next time, we look about green hydrogen production, about innovative approaches. So we will learn a little bit more about high temperature electrolysis and about photocatalytic hydrogen production, which is also uh, <clears throat> quite new and most likely also quite promising option to provide, let's say, hydrogen. This is what we will tackle next week, again, Wednesday night at seven o'clock and with this, I would be very happy if you are back in this time and then listen to this <clears throat> webinar. And with this, I would like to thank especially Fabian Karls for the nice presentation and for the great support for our presentation or jo joint presentation tonight. And additionally, I would like to thank Felix Mendler and Wolfram Tuszewicki for making this happen and taking care of all the challenges which are, let's say, behind the scene to <clears throat> organize that the technology works. And last but not least, of course, I would like to thank you all, our participants, 
for being here and for being patient that it does not work right away. And last but not least, I would like also to thank the organizer and the hosts for making this webinar possible. With this, have a beautiful evening. Don't enjoy yourself. And I would be happy to, let's say, welcome you again next